Warning, Kinda Murdery contains adult themes, explicit language, and descriptions of violence. It is not suitable for anyone, and we recommend you stop listening now. California's rugged and scenic northwestern corner is the beginning of the great Pacific Northwest. Of the great Pacific Northwest. The region of untamed and primitive beauty. And the Humboldt County Sheriff's Department has now joined efforts with Illegal the Arcata Police. Off yeah. the grid. Humboldt County also has the highest rate of missing persons in the epicenter of the American economy. A lot of evil here. A lot of evil. This is Kind of Murdery, and you're entering the Emerald Triangle. Wow, that was nuts. Hey everybody, welcome to Kinda Murdery. I'm your host, Zevin Odelberg. Thank you for deciding to be here. As I mentioned on last week's show, I have cerebral palsy. And to whatever degree I can, I'd like to use Kinda Murdery to help create a support network for people with disabilities. If you or someone you know is struggling with a disability, please email the show, kindamurdery at gmail.com or at kindamurdery on all social media. I'm here for you. Okay, on to today's story. Now I know I've been straying from the Emerald Triangle a bit lately. Like last week when I crept south into Napa County and took you all over the US and Canada for the horrible story of the Gorilla Strangler. Well today I'm going to slide over and down into Sonoma and San Joaquin counties to cover the dual murder of James Willett, scion of the legendary Bardstown, Kentucky Bourbon Empire, and his teenage bride. This is a story that touches on the powerfully malignant reach, even from prison, of a notorious cult leader. But before I do that, I've got to introduce you to my guest today. Returning to Kinda Murdery is a fantastic friend of the show. He's brilliant in so many ways. Right now is WGBH producer Russ Marash on HBO Max's outstanding dramedy, Julia, about Julia Child and the first televised cooking show. In fact, it was just announced like hours ago that it got renewed for a second season, which I'm super stoked about because my wife and I love the show. Here with me today is actor, writer, director, Fran Kranz. Hey, Fran, how you doing? Hey, hey, man. How are you? It's great. I know. Yeah. Whoa. Whoa. Second season two. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. No, it's exciting. It's like, um, I mean, uh... <laughs> <laughs> now, now I'm now I'm self conscious. Like now, wait, now I'm being recorded. This is my reaction. I'm being like, yeah, yeah. Really, I'll, really. I'll, I'll put a Fuck I'll put an yeah. air horn sound in there. <laughs> burr, burr, burr. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. I have the show real. It is kind of funny, like the kind of show to react <laughs> that way, you know. Yeah. But I'm like, yeah. God damn, yeah. Um, like, like you're this WWE it, you know? wrestler. You're like, yeah, season two, I'm going to rip off your head and right, take right, a right, steaming right. dump um, down your neck. Julia, bitches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, weirdly, yeah, right, exactly. Like, sort of aggressive, <laughs> macho sort of celebration for, like, this yeah Julia Child show. Yeah. Um, no, it's great. I mean, I, 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 I sort of – I. When I saw it, I got to watch four episodes early, and I, I was, you know, I, I'm so used to, uh, yeah, I mean, at this point, I get um, such little joy <laughs> in watching myself. Uh, I mean, truthfully, like, I just, I feel like I've been in lots of bad stuff, and sometimes even when you're excited, you're you're the most critical, and you, you know what I mean? So I just kind of... It's not that I don't watch myself, but I don't always. And I also, you know, I uh, I sort of expect the worst. And <laughs> um, so I was so like pleasantly surprised. Like it was so it was so well done. Like I knew we had a great time on set, but it was so well done. Everybody was great. Sarah was even better than I remembered. And like I've never really experienced that before where, you know, I was on set with her. Obviously, I'm like right there. And I know she's great. Everybody's talking about how great she is. And she's both subtle and also captures 
the sort of larger than life qualities to Julia Child. But then you, when I watched her, I thought, man, I didn't, I didn't even notice that. Like I somehow missed some of the minutia and the, the, yeah, the yeah. details and subtleties of all that she was doing. I found I saw more on screen than I did right in front of her. And I don't know if I've ever sort of I can't really think of another time I've experienced that. So it was just um, it was just all good. But it made me look, I felt sort of confident. You never know these days, but people, you know, it feels like shows are renewed. I mean, I just read how Netflix is going to just slice their production, you know, I think like more than half. Have you heard of, you know, when they, their stock fell like 35%, you know? So, but, but there's been this, I feel like trend where shows just get picked up so quickly. And it's like, is anyone actually watching all this stuff? And, um, but for, with this one, I felt, I felt pretty confident. So, well, you know, it's great. Yeah, yeah, it really is. And I'll tell you, it's funny because we're, you were joking about the, the macho reaction to yeah. season yeah. two. You know, and I Sorry. think, you know, maybe, maybe not, maybe not everybody. That's so funny. I'm just cracking up. Maybe not everybody listening knows, but anyone who's listened to season one probably knows that uh, you and I are friends and have been for a long time. And, yeah. you know, I have a, I have a embarrassing admission to make, which is I don't always watch everything you're in. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah you're like i feel the same way about your stuff wow yeah, yeah i could get no joy out of it um <laughs> no 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 i just yeah. mean you know no, no, no. yeah that well ta- no i mean you just uh you know take uh, it as a take it as a testament to your success the truth is you're in a lot of stuff i don't have i, I have a podcast to put out i've got a job and a family i just don't have yeah. time to catch it all even though i'm sure it's all excellent Maybe I don't watch every single thing you do. I, I watch most of it. And, and But with Julia, you know, I wasn't initially sure that it was going to be my cup of tea. I don't know if I have some sort of mostly erroneous yeah. image of myself as like the macho toxic male that's like yelling WWE style like you alluded to or what. But I was yeah. like, you know, when I grew up, I was only allowed to watch PBS because I had education focused hippie parents who hated TV and violence. Like basically <laughs> yeah. my mom and my dad were both Paul Child from, uh, you know, David Hyde Pierce from Julia. His yeah, attitude yeah. towards television and all things modern. My parents still had that attitude in 1990. So, right. <laughs> so when you're like, oh, WGBH, Julia Child, cooking show, I'm like, yeah, the, you mean the only thing besides Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers that I was actually allowed to watch as a child? Great. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's awesome. I love your parents, by the way. So oh, thank you. Shout out to your parents. I, well, I've been to your that house that you grew up in. And yeah, I mean, I think by the time I visited you, there was definitely, I mean, I guess you had a television. It's not that you didn't have yeah. a television. But yeah. But no, 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 no. I can see. I mean, you were out, you know, yeah, different, different lifestyle. I mean, to think about ugh, what kids are to, I mean, my daughter's asking for an iPad every chance she gets. And like, oh my I feel God. like a failure as a parent, but also you just, I mean, it, it, it is kind of scary the way things go. So sort of yeah. the, the integrity or kind of the how your parents held on, I have a ton of respect for, you know, even if it was not a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I do, and so I want to get back to Julie in a moment, because where I'm actually going with this is that I sat down and watched it with my wife, almost out of a sense of duty, because I knew you were coming on the show. Yeah. And we both just love it. We love it. I love yeah. it so much. Like, we, we, I haven't finished it yet, but we basically binged the first, like, four and a half episodes in a row, which we never do. We never watch more than like an episode, maybe two of a show, just because the way that the scheduling of our lives work out. And yeah. we sat down on like a Sunday and we watched like five straight hours of Julia because we were <laughs> loving it that much. Yeah. So yeah. when, when I heard about the season two renewal, well, when I saw it online, it popped up about an hour before we're recording. Now I was the one that was like, yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> Julia bitches. I was like macho yeah. man, Randy Savage. So like <laughs> it really uh, is that good. Even if it sounds like something you think you'll hate the invention of the first cooking show on PBS in the sixties about fricking French cooking and Blob. Like it, it honestly sounds like the absolute worst to any <laughs> red blooded American male, but it's not. It's amazing. It's so good. So go watch it. Julie on yeah. HBO Max. All right. So 
And let's jump into the story of the murder of James Willett and his teenage bride, and the truly wild and murderous career of Squeaky Fromm. James Willett was born in 1946, the son of A. Thompson Willett, president of the Willett Distilling Company. By the way, that's some good juice. Uh, the Willett family estate four-year rye, dang. Uh, have you ever had? Yeah. A, have you ever had any Willet, Fran? I was going to say this is Willet, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Willet. It's Willet. You know, yeah, next Willett, yeah. I, after I learned about this story, I was like, oh man, the next time I drink Willet whiskey, I really hope I don't think about this horrific murder I'm about to tell you about that involves young women and a veteran getting decapitated and all kinds is, of horrible is stuff. Jesus? Is he? Where does he fall in like the family tree of the actual sort of founder? So founder Willett Bourbon Willett was founded yeah. in 1936 and James Willett was the son of Willett Bourbon founder Aloysius Lambert Thompson Willett. Direct line. This is not a cousin or a nephew. This is like the Willett. Yeah, and I feel, I feel like I just was had a bottle of Willet bourbon. So yeah, this is all cre creepy already. Yeah. Uh, so um, he's born in 1946, and then in the early 60s he enrolls at the University of Kentucky. Go Cats! Shout out to Jerry and Tracy Polly from Hillbilly Horror Stories who live in Lexington, which is where the University of Kentucky is. But uh -huh. then it's uh, Vietnam War time, and he leaves the university to enlist in the Marine Corps. He spends four years in the Marines, has a decorated career, and then he comes back to Kentucky to discover that all of the friends that he grew up with have essentially become anti-war hippies and are really disrespectful of his service record. And he has a really hard time, understandably, uh, dealing with that four years of hell in Vietnam and you come home and everybody you knew is treating you like garbage. It's wild. So yeah, it's, I mean, so he's in Vietnam. So we can probably expect like PTSD and yeah, yeah four, yeah, four yeah, years yeah. of heavy combat in Vietnam as a Marine. So he re-enrolls in the university of Kentucky to uh, finish his degree, but he really, he just can't The disconnect between the jungle and being back in Kentucky rooting for the cats it is too extreme. Yeah. Um, and so he drops out of the university and he adopts more of the counterculture lifestyle that his friends had the direction all of his friends who are anti war have gone. And he's really just kind of at loose ends, not sure how to feel about himself, not sure what to do with his life. And so he flies out to California and he moves to the Los Angeles area. So he moves to Los Angeles where he meets a woman named Lauren Olmstead. And when I say woman, it's really closer to being a girl. James Willett is 26. Lauren Olmstead is 19, but they get married. And Lauren, by the way, is from a well-to-do family in Connecticut who wanted her to go to university, but she didn't want to go. So she also ran away to California. And one of the things that kind of struck me about the symmetry between the stories of these two East Coast kind of blue yeah. blood young people is this idea that California, even in the late 60s to 70s, had some kind of a connotation of wildness yeah. and freedom i think you and i are both from california so i couldn't say but maybe it still does california that's where you go to get away from being oppressed yeah. by your family i mean this already it's, it feels like a story we know or we've seen and we you know you, you sort of in our collective imagination about the time mm -hmm. period, that's what's already very unsettling and <laughs> upsetting about this is this is this is all about to go horribly wrong yeah yes yes it is uh and it's funny you should mention that because it is about to go horribly wrong, and who should factor into this murder story in a, ta in a tangential, but also not at all tangential way, but the most famous of Hollywood hippie murderers. I'll give you three guesses. Who is it? Uh, um, Manson. Manson. Yeah. Charlie friggin' Manson. Well, I was going to say, yeah, yeah, yikes. He's actually <laughs> involved in the story. He passes through indirectly i mean he at this point it's 1972 so manson himself is already in prison oh got it however okay. however 
there's a woman who some of you may have heard of. Her name is Squeaky Fromm. Wow. Apparently, she had a super high voice. And so, Squeaky and so, what? Charlie, Squeaky Fromm. Squeaky Fromm. Okay. Sorry, I don't mean to laugh. At this. <laughs> Her name was Lynette Alice Fromm. Okay. Yeah, definitely. But Charlie, because of her super high, like, Minnie Mouse voice, Charlie Manson nicknamed her Squeaky, and she was known as Squeaky From. And she was the most devout and sort of spiritually, physically, and romantically, in every way, smitten and in love with Charles Manson. In fact, while Charles Manson was on trial, she actually held a solo almost continuous 24-hour everyday vigil outside the courthouse. Yeah. She was the ultimate Charlie Manson true believer. Right. It's sad that that's like what he, how he treats his, like, you know, acolytes and fans and sort of ardent, you know, devoted, you know, lovers, giving them diminutive little nicknames, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, squeaky. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so... The Willets fall in with the Manson family. Charlie's in prison, but Squeaky Fromm is the leader of the cult post Charlie being in prison because of the degree to which she was devoted Mm. to Charlie. So they fall in with the Mansons. And at this point, the Mansons have sort of amalgamated and incorporated the Aryan Brotherhood, this uh, Nazi prison gang. So... Boy, this yeah. this gets real real dark. Yeah. Well, just real quick. So Lauren and James, the couple, yes. it, 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 they're they're into some weird stuff. Like they're already like as I thought, you know, potentially we're just talking about this sweet couple in California in the late sixties, seventies, and um, but no, they're hanging out with really kind of intense, scary, bad people. It's funny because it sort of depends on which source you read. Uh-huh. Okay. There's basically two different versions of this story. One is James flew out to Hollywood. He was at loose ends. We're going to do sort of the classic biblical blame the woman for everything. He meets this pretty young girl. She's already hanging with the Mansons. Mm. He doesn't really understand just how screwed up the situation is until all of a sudden they start knocking over liquor stores to fund their lifestyle. At which point he says, you guys, I'm not down with this. I am going to turn you into the police. And that is when they make him put on his dress uniform, walk him out to the woods along the highway in Gurneyville uh, in Sonoma County, make him dig his own grave and shoot him to death with a 22 and a 12 gauge shotgun and also a 20 gauge shotgun. So like a major overkill situation. Then they decapitate him and, and bury him in the grave. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's that's what happened. I just kind of spit it all out there. That is um, so intense. And Gurnville, right? Yeah, Gurneyville. Gurneyville, right? Sonoma County. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I know exactly the area. Yeah, wow. That's so intense. So wait a second. I was expecting him to be the, the killer. Maybe yeah, he no. said that from the beginning. Wow. No, he's the victim. I try to start with the victims as best as I can. Um. Yeah, so he's murdered. But he and Lauren, at this point, when they're living with the Mansons, they have a seven-month-old daughter. Wow. So there's two versions of the story, which is decorated war hero goes west, falls in love with girl, doesn't realize he's in with the Mansons in the Aryan Brotherhood until it's really too late. And when he tries to stand up for the right thing, they just kill him. And then his poor wife stays living with the Mansons for months afterwards because she's afraid they'll murder her baby if she doesn't. And then ultimately, they become paranoid, the Mansons do, that she will turn them into the cops for killing James Willett. And so they murder her and bury her in the basement of this house they're living in on Flores Street in Stockton. Jesus. Don't tell me. Where is the baby? This is too much. What happens to the infant? Somewhat incredibly, thank God, I guess the Manson family are not complete monsters because they don't harm the baby. 
And I mean, they are complete monsters, but apparently there was a line that even they wouldn't cross. They don't harm the baby. What happens is a hiker comes across James Willett's corpse along the highway in Gurneyville. It's badly decomposed at this point. The head is missing, but they are able to identify him ultimately. And that then leads them to the house in Stockton where they find Lauren's body, yeah. Lauren Olmstead, now Willett, buried in the basement. And they arrest the Mansons who still have the baby. And the baby ultimately, and this is maybe a ray of sunshine in this story, is adopted by her maternal grandparents. Ah. The Olmsteads in, in Kentucky. Back in, uh, oh, in Kentucky? Or not in Kentucky, I'm sorry. The Olmsteads back in Connecticut, yes. Wow. The Olmsteads back in Connecticut, yeah. So that's the official record of the story. There's another version which has been propagated more by online conspiracy sites and Manson family fanatics and people who write quote-unquote nonfiction books that read more like uh, airport thriller novels. Yeah. Uh, is that the Willets were just whole hog Manson acolytes themselves, that James was a total lunatic, that the other Aryan Brotherhood people murdered him because they didn't necessarily trust him, but that Lauren stuck with the Mansons not because she was worried for her baby's life, but because she was just a Manson herself. Yeah. So, and the version of that story that I've come across is a version that sets um, Squeaky Fromm, who was the leader of this little cabal of post-Charlie's prison term Mansons, as more of the protagonist. Five people go on trial for the murder of the Willets, and two of the men sort of surprise everyone by pleading guilty. Wow. Michael Monfort, James T. Craig... William M. Goucher. And they're all convicts linked to uh, the Aryan Brotherhood. And then Monfort and Goucher shock everyone by pleading guilty. Uh, they get 30-year prison terms. A couple of the women, not Squeaky from, get five-year terms for being accessories. Squeaky, by the way, gets a credibly long life sentence in prison, but not for anything to do with the Willets. She goes to prison because get ready for this one squeaky from ends up in prison because on september 5th 1975 she attempts to assassinate president gerald ford wow yeah wow and that's that is wild i'm i'm amazed i've never heard of this person so was i yeah um uh, sort of i know Aaron, right Aaron or whatever to uh manson and uh, Tried to assassinate a president? That's crazy. I know she did. She did. Wow. Real quick side note, a woman named Sarah Jane Moore, previously con, also tried to <laughs> I shouldn't laugh at this. Also tried to assassinate President. I just keep thinking of the uh of the uh Dana Carvey sketch from SNL where he's playing Tom Brokaw who wants to go on vacation, so he has to pre record oh, every yes, possible so way that Gerald Ford could die. Yeah. Former President Gerald Ford yeah. died today. Yeah. yeah, it's eaten by a bear. It's like, oh, come on. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that so that's, I, yeah. I apologize, everyone. Please forgive me for starting to chuckle while talking about attempted assassinations. They're not funny at all. It's just what jumped into my head was Dana Carvey as Tom Brokaw. And I think that is very funny. So that same week, that same week that Squeaky From tried to assassinate President Gerald Ford, this woman, Sarah Jane Moore, also attempted to assassinate Gerald Ford. Wow. Sarah Jane Moore got a lot closer. The only reason she didn't kill him is that she was no longer using her own gun because it had had a mechanical failure the day before and because a brave Marine jumped forward and grabbed her arm at the last moment, but she ended up actually shooting someone. In the case of Squeaky Fromm, she showed up wearing like some kind of weird red Masonic robe. So I would think that she would put the, uh, the Secret Service on high alert right away. And she had a Colt 1911 pistol, and she attempted to shoot Gerald Ford, but the gun misfired. That's what was said initially. And then later she said, no, it didn't misfire. I actually took my one cartridge out of the gun 
because I had decided before that day that I didn't actually want to kill the president. And this version of events uh, was backed up by reality when the police went to the apartment where she had been staying after she was arrested and found a single 45 ACP cartridge Jesus. on the floor of her bathroom, which amazingly enough matched exactly her story of why she didn't kill the president was because she had the one bullet to do it with that she decided to take out of the gun, but for some reason still went through with the, with the ritual well, of it, well, which is totally bonkers. Totally bonkers. Wow. Uh, she was like, I was just practicing. <laughs> yeah. And these, yeah. these Mansonite women at the time had, they all had bald heads and swastikas carved into their foreheads, just like, just like Charlie, like completely nuts. So get this. She gets, well, she gets a life sentence in prison for attempting to assassinate the president, which is not terribly surprising, along with being associated with the Mansons and all these other murders. But what they actually get her for is the attempted assassination on President Gerald Ford, even though arguably, and I don't know if ironically is the right word exactly, she didn't actually, actually attempt yeah. to assassinate him. She went through this bizarre I don't know what to even call it. Morality play version of wow. attempting to assassinate what him. What was the sentence? What is your, where did she, she got a life sentence. Wow. And yeah, I, mean, I guess, yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah, I you, a, he, she still pulled out a real punishment. gun and pointed it at the president of the United yeah. States and pulled yeah. the trigger. So, you wow. know, plus the Mansons, by the way, they'd already been, Charles was already in prison. A bunch of them had already gone to prison for killing the Willits. A bunch of them had gone to prison for killing Sharon Tate and everyone involved in that. And yeah. she was famously the most devout follower of Charlie Manson. So there's a lot of circumstantial evidence there where, well, we, we finally got you for semi pretending to shoot the president, but yeah. we've basically known for 15 years that you were there giggling while the rest of these sickos carved everybody up or strangled them or whatever they did, yeah, right? Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, so she goes to prison for life. But then in 1987, which would have been 12 years later, and this is totally crazy to me. I can't believe how often I come across this researching for kind of murdery. She escapes from prison in 1987. Wow. How do people escape from prison escape? and yeah, mental I asylums just, all the time? Yeah, yeah. I was thinking the same thing. I was like, how has anyone ever done that? Like, how is it? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, you know, I don't know what it says about me and my will to live and be free, but I feel like if I went to prison, trying to escape would not even occur to me. Like, I, I wouldn't even think <laughs> to attempt it, let alone succeed, you yeah. know? So she escapes. Yeah. yeah but then is found two days later sort of wandering and disoriented and put back in prison and has additional time tacked onto her sentence. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you also, that someone that crazy uh, wandering around disoriented, taking a, a, a gun, empty, you know, like I'm just surprised she has the wherewithal, you know, the resources or sort of the follow through or, you know, just clarity of mind to just escape prison. Yeah, honestly, I, and this is, in, you know, it's a great point you just made and it applies to last week's story too about a horrific serial killer named Earl Nelson who escaped from the uh, asylum numerous times i question the insanity of anyone who can pull off a prison or criminal asylum escape I, right, i'm not right. sure i believe that you can be insane unfit to stand trial didn't know you were killing people and yet still have the ability to plan and the wherewithal to follow through in high leverage situations while supposedly being insane. Yeah, well, maybe. I mean, she obviously, if she was running this gang or sort of the the the, the leader, or what it, you know, she would, maybe she had some charisma and influence that that wasn't you know noticeable. Because you imagine someone was like helping her, you know, some you know, right? I feel like a lot of these stories, there's some right. inside or some you know. Yes, yes, some yes. she probably help. convert. You're saying she may have converted a yeah. either a guard or perhaps. A lower security prisoner who had been given some kind of a, a job. Yeah. And I think that's likely. 
Um, but so she is recaptured and they add another five years to her life, her 30 year sentence. Um, well, actually I should put it this way. A life sentence is 25 years to life. So they add five years to her 25 years. People hear life. They think it means you're in prison for your entire life, but it means you're in prison for 25 years and as much as life, depending on your behavior. So she now has a 30 year sentence. Well, in 2004, she's eligible for parole. That's 30 years after her attempted assassination of Gerald Ford. She chooses not to apply for it. In 2009, she is paroled. Now, do you want to hear something that just absolutely blows my mind, actually? Regardless of the circumstances of a prisoner, no matter what they did, there is a federal law, not a state law, so don't go blaming left-wing California or whoever you might want to try to blame. There is a federal law that states that if you have served 30 years in prison with satisfactory behavior, you must be paroled. Wow. It doesn't matter what you did. I mean, assuming you weren't convicted without the possibility of parole. If you have the possibility of parole... Even if you're a murderer, even if you're whatever, 30 years, huh? 30 years and you must be paroled. And so in 2009, she is paroled. In 2019, she goes on TV and she's being interviewed and they ask her about being in love with Charlie Manson. And she says, well, yeah, I was in love with him. She says, I still am. What? Uh, creepy. Uh, why are you living free? Like, like maybe you shouldn't be in prison anymore, but if you're still, by your own admission on national television, romantically and spiritually in love with Charles Manson, regardless of everything that you know that he did, yeah, how are you just bopping around doing whatever you want to do? Yeah. Yeah, danger to society, maybe. I don't know. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. My yeah. man, I, she I, sounds terrifying. I mean, I'm sort yeah. of embarrassed. I never like heard of her, or knew about her, but she sounds just terrifying. Yeah, squeaky from. Well, she's out there, man. Maybe she might hear this episode and be like, "What do you yeah, mean? Yeah, Why yeah, am I free?" Not talk about her. Anymore. Yeah, does she have. Um, does she still have uh, any scars on her forehead? I don't, I'd have to Google her, but I imagine she does. I mean, yeah. yeah. I don't want to see what she looks like. She sounds really, really horrifying. Yeah. Right. So, by the way, yeah, Sarah Jane before. Moore. The other woman who tried to kill Gerald Ford the same week also paroled 2007 and is out there, although she's 92, so that's a little less scary. Yeah. Just trying to imagine getting out of jail for murder at 92. <laughs> God. Um, just want to put myself in their shoes for a second. Um, yeah, geez, man. Frightening, frightening stuff. And uh, I wonder how old that girl is. That's a crazy thing, way to grow up, you know? Yeah. Orphan yeah. to the Manson family. Yeah, well, that girl, she would be, thir- she'd be 50 now, 50-ish. Be, wow, wow. The, you know, that area, so I love that whole area, so, you know, all the way up through California and, you know, the coast and everything. And it's kind of, of course, things like that have gone up up there. But, you know, it's so, I find it so peaceful and pleasant and beautiful. So now you've sort of mm. like scarred, yeah, you've kind of really tainted. Yeah. Uh, well, you know. Monte Rio, Girdsville, got yeah. that whole little area. Yeah. Sorry, like man. The forest is terrifying now. Um, yeah. You know, because I grew up, obviously, in the Emerald Triangle. And same thing, yeah. you know, I always felt so peaceful and safe and beautiful. And then I start researching the show and it's like, nope. Basically, no matter where you go in the world, you're just, it's just murderville everywhere. Nowhere is safe. And if it's safe-ish now, it wasn't 30 years ago or 50 years ago or something. I mean, human beings' propensity to just willy-nilly murder each other is pretty ridiculous. And of course, when places are more or less unpopulated, it's easier to get away with it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Willy-nilly murder. <laughs> murder bill yeah geez yikes um, <laughs> Willy Nilly murder bill. sounds like the worst children's program ever you're yeah. like russ marash did not green light that one yeah <laughs> i've got an idea for a new puppet show russ it's called willy nilly murderville oh, man 
Oh God, that's it's such a disturbing, disturbing yeah, sorry. story. Um, maybe I have to look. It's, it's also the Gerald Ford. I wonder how if that skit was sort of inspired by the multiple assassination attempts. Also his age, but yeah. Right. I mean, yeah, poor Gerald Ford. I mean, look, he may not have been the greatest president in American history, but did he deserve to get assassination attempts twice in the same week? No. No, come on. <laughs> no president deserves any kind of assassination attempts, but twice in the same week seems pretty extreme. It's pretty extreme. Yeah. And again, how I'm just how did I not know about that? It's crazy. You know what, Fran? Uh, now that we've covered the murder and the crazy career of Squeaky From, I I'm such a fan of Julia, your hit show on HBO Max, that I really want to talk to you more about it. So uh, I'm going to do that. I sort of think of Julia, even though in some ways it's quite different, I think of it as the third entry in this trilogy of incredible shows that are roughly a half an hour about really magnetic, uh, mature women. Uh, and, and I'm yeah. thinking about, um, Schitt's Creek and yeah. hacks <laughs> and now Julia, yeah. all three of those shows have these female protagonists who are just utterly charming and in their yeah. portrayal and humanity totally transcend all, all the expectations you might go into it with regarding what they're capable of in terms of entertaining you based on sort of their demographic breaks for lack of a, a more elegant way to put that. In other words, yeah, all three Very of those elegant. shows Very. and those actresses <laughs> really surprised me. And I think will surprise anyone who has any preconceptions about what they're going to absolutely fall in love with. And so I, I, I put Julia right up there with Schitt's Creek and hacks in terms of excellence and fingers crossed that it gets the awards recognition because I think that it should. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. No, that's really good company. And yeah, no, you're totally right. And I also, I was so taken with, I mean, obviously I read the scripts, but the, the chemistry of, uh, you know, Paul and Julia or Sarah and David Hyde Pierce, um, yes, yes. and that, that marriage, the sort of support system of the marriage is so, uh, admirable and lovable and just, you know, it kind of, it felt to me kind of unique to television, at least right now. Cause you get a lot of dark and oh, yeah. you, you get married, you get married couples fighting all the time. And this is something so much more, uh, it, it feels incredibly interesting because of how supportive and sort of hardworking they are at making it. A yes. Good marriage, yes. And how know? aware yeah. of each other's shortcomings they are and how forgiving yeah, yeah. of those shortcomings yeah. they are like this idea that we, you know, we, we're so quick to forgive failures in ourselves and we often are so intolerant of failures in our partners. But these, you know, yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, no. <laughs> but these, these uh, two people are not. Um, and I think that's one of the wonderful things about the show is that in Sarah and David and yourself, you have these actually veteran comic actors uh, and and dramatic actors. I'm not going to say you guys are just comic actors by any means, but I I've always believed that in a, there, in a lot of ways, comedy is harder because of the timing and the nimbleness that it requires. And yeah. so, obviously, David Hyde Pierce on Frasier, um, you've done a lot of comedic stuff. And, and I think that skill set, particularly among Julia and Paul, allows them to um, navigate situations that could be dark and heavy and sort of predictable in a way that has a light touch where to me you still get the emotional depth without all the blood and guts and railing and hating each other that you see as you alluded to in so many TV and film relationships these days. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I love that. Yeah, and he, I mean, David I. Pierce is like the funniest person in the world. He's, uh, he's, he's got, a, he's up there of anyone I've ever met. He's like a, I was saying this to someone. He's like a time, he's like time travel funny, and by that I mean, <laughs> he, he has the funniest line so quick. Like he's so quick. Some something happens. He's, he has the line. It's as if he was able to experience the moment beforehand and come up with the perfect line for it. You know what I mean? Like that's, it's always, it's like too quick to believe his sense of humor. So, so that's yeah, amazing. Truly. That sounds like the reflexes of a professional baseball player or something that, you know, right. just totally. all of those yeah. reps have, have created a level of excellence that 
plays as almost superhuman to those around him. Super. Yeah, totally. No, totally. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I, uh, so, oh, like for when you were talking, when you were talking about how in Julia, you get to see something that feels like it's rare for, um, for, for television these days and the way that these relationships are navigated. There was, there's one moment in particular, and I think it's maybe in episode three, you can correct me, but Julia and her best friend are discussing all the things that they had to do to kind of massage the egos of some of the leading men in the show being um, David Hyde Pierce, uh-huh. Paul's character, and then also Duke, the, the insufferably uh, pretentious guy with the What Have I Been Reading show. Uh, yeah, Jefferson yes, A. Yes, yes. Albert Dumel. Yes, yeah, he's hilarious. He's, yeah. Yes, and so she, the best friend says, and I apologize for not recalling her name right now. Um, Phoebe Newworth okay. Avis. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. she says, "Imagine what we could get done in a day if we didn't have to spend all of our time apologizing <laughs> to the egos of men." Yeah, yeah. That is a statement that, in, in various paraphrased forms, that you hear all the time in popular culture right now. And there's certainly a lot of truth to it, but I love Julia's response when she says, well, who's apologizing? Vive la difference. I, I, not French. She says, long live the differences between the sexes is what I say. And I, and I love the mm-hmm. fact that her take on it is, look, if you care about somebody you can in ways that you might feel like are unnecessary, but you can cater to their needs and their emotional needs without feeling like it somehow makes you less or limits you. You just understand that this is what my husband or my man or however you want to put it needs. And I'm willing to give it to him. And he gives me other things that I need in his way that may seem strange or unnecessary based on how he's programmed. And I thought yeah. that was such a uh, such a great reminder to just sort of create space to be with each other and understand that we're all humans and are going through some version of the same emotional tumult and that it's not some zero-sum game where yeah. men or women in mass are either going forward or backwards in every interaction. So, so I, I loved that reminder too. Yeah. No, I love that. No, totally. I mean, I wish she was uh, my couple's therapist, you know. She was, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, no, I uh it, it's it, it's it, it's beautifully kind of like sentimental and evolved, you know. It's sort of it's a really yeah, it's a really kind of I mean, look, it's Daniel's an amazing amazing quick writer but has such a kind of uh, a beautiful heart, you know, because it, I think the show is so charming. Um, I think it's, it, you know, it's it's sort of deceiving in a way that it feels lighter than I think it really mm-hmm. is. And I think mm-hmm. that's sort of a perfect example, you yeah. know, where it's sort of like it's delectable and looks amazing and you can kind of enjoy it. And that's that feels like a moment to sort of laugh. Yeah. But you can look at it. You can kind of see sort of an intelligent, much more sort of insightful, thoughtful point to it. Um, you, you know, if you pay a little bit more closer attention. Yeah, and in, in fact, I left out the best part of that interaction, which is at the end, after she says that, she then says, and what's the best friend's name? What's the character's name? Do you ever call it? Do you, Avis. A- Avis. Avis. Yeah. She goes, don't be so black and white, Avis. It's unbecoming. Yeah. You know, <laughs> which beautifully yeah. encapsulates the point I just used about a thousand words to make about the fact that <laughs> it doesn't have to be some zero sum game. We, we, we're we yeah. in a moment in time right now and not just with gender relations, but with so many issues where everybody just kind of wants to say it's either a hundred percent this or it's a hundred percent that. And if I'm this and you're that, then you're morally bankrupt. Yeah. And but, you know, there's, there's just so much absolutism. Yeah. And it was so nice to be reminded of a time not that long ago where there was a certain gentility and expectation of basic human goodness that allowed us to be a little bit less judgmental of each other. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I love that. I mean, that's all I can say. I'm afraid to speak against absolutism. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, I've only got a rinky dig podcast to lose. You're on HBO, so right. I, I no, hear no, you. I'm I hear kidding. You. No, 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 no. But yeah, it's no, no, man. I I love it, and it's I I'm I just appreciate. I think it's awesome that you you those lines stuck with you mm-hmm. as well because I I know the moment, but um. Uh, that's great. I mean, it's just a good tribute to the show that it's it's landing that I way. I do also want to talk a little bit specifically about your character. And you're, oh, yeah. you're great. You arrive with a Thanks, lot of man. nuance, which is cool because when you first show up, when we first see you and you've got your, it's 1962, but it's really 1952, like perfect hair. And look, yeah. you're, a, you're like a aquiline white guy you look very you have a very classic look right and you're immediately just kind of bossing around the the girl who works for you and and doing all the kind of unremarkably sexist kind of behavior that we've kind of come to understand was just the way things were in the early 60s (laughs) so when we first meet your character we're like oh is this gonna be sort of the heel in the in the show like are you gonna be the jock to julia's you know revenge of the nerds here Yeah. And then I think you unpack your character in a very graceful and nuanced way that makes it a lot of fun to watch you round out and become totally three dimensional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish I had had a moment to be like, nerd, 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 (laughs) whatever the thing is in the movie. Um, Yeah, no, it's... uh, it's funny because I, speaking about the hair specifically, <laughs> um, you know, I was, I was learning about the guy and researching the guy. We were reading a lot and, you know, then we kind of did our camera tests and I, you know, I was like, you know, I, I mean, here's a picture of the guy in 1963 and, uh, you know, it's not, it's not so intense. And then Charles McDougal, who directed the first two episodes, he's a producer on the show, who's amazing and amazing. I mean, he really set the look and the kind of the momentum and the mm-hmm, sort of feel mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. tone of the show and just that that production the 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 quality of the production you know i think charles like there's a a little scene where i'm walking in the rain in the script it was just like you know russ walking in the rain through harvard square and i mean it was <laughs> pouring like insanely pouring he had he like brought out all the stops and it was just like a torrential downpour but like things like that i think just you know add yeah, it set a, it set the bar mm-hmm, for the mm-hmm, show, mm-hmm. and so I, I attribute so much of the sort of look and the success of the aesthetic to Charles. But he um, he was like, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't really care what he looked like. You know what I mean? We're we're, we're establishing exactly what you sort of saw and pointed out. Right. It's 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 1952 and 1962. But you know, Russ has a journey that's that's more nuanced, and sort of he he goes yeah, somewhere. You're more you know, human he's going than to, human, so to speak. Yeah, and so but it's but it's important. We want to sort of have this look to sort of set set what you think is some kind of precedent for the character in the world and like have it have it sort of evolve you know so it's actually you know looking back on it because i i was taking it quite literally and being like well hey this is russ this is what he looked like why am i you know why do i look like Mad Men? um and and you know i i I get it and uh it's you know he's not I, i i what i love about the part is that he's you know, he's also an artist, you know, mm-hmm. he, he, in, he in real life, you know, he, he studied, he was a theater studies major, you yeah. know, and he, so was he I. talked about, Yay. yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. And having the opportunity to go to New York to just be an assistant director in a Beckett play. And so it's, it's, it, it, he's not exactly what you think he is. And so his problem with, with Julia it's it's not necessarily sort of chauvinism and in, 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 in or sexism. It's it's I don't I don't b- believe in the content. You know I don't I don't think this is what we should be doing on public television. I and wanna, the chauvinism, yeah. if it's there, is a layer deeper, which is that he doesn't really believe that something that's like a woman's subject matter could ultimately be intellectually consequential. So there, yes. there's a yeah. there's a larger cultural sexism, but that maybe is not directed at Julia personally so much. Yeah, yeah, and that was a fun thing to play because it's you know, and I, I get this, and people reacting to it, they're like, "Oh, you're a jerk!" Like you're the oh, you're the bad guy, you know, things like that. Because there's there's sort of no one else to sort of you know, there's no real other source of conflict, you know. I mean, as up the, the, I'm just kidding. 
<laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah. The, the show goes on. You get to see, I mean, Albert and Hunter and the other characters at WGBH. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. sort of all sort of forces of opposition at times. Uh-huh. But, um, you know, he's established as that guy that they kind of have to get around. But it's the reasons he's in her way, I, I think, are are more complicated or just yeah. sort of emotionally true. Right. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. And, and have a. Yeah. Well, let me yeah. tell you what Which, I love about the guy. Um, what I love about him and how you play him and how he's written is that, again, I'm going to compare this to sort of where the world is today, which is we expect him to be sort of like this wrestling heel that's like, no, women's issues and cooking doesn't matter, and I'm going to just kill myself to over my dead body will Julia Child get a show. Um, And that's what we expect with people these days. It's like nobody ever allows their mind to be changed. You just like take a position, someone else takes theirs, and then you fight to the death over it. Nobody, (laughs) Nobody can ever be convinced. There's no such thing as facts. There's no such thing as science. That's why you can't talk politics because the tradition of rationally persuading somebody based on a shared reality is completely out the window. But what I love about Russ and the way that you play him is even when he sets out to stop Julia's show because he doesn't believe in it, when he sets out to draw lines in the sand and no way we're not doing this, it's not going to work, it's etc. He still always allows himself and you allow yourself to be affected by Julia's charm and humanity. Um, yeah. Maybe. And also by this, the reasonable solutions that she offers. Somebody else could say, no, Julia, you can't pay for it. It's our intellectual property. We need to own it. We can't afford it. You want to pay for it yourself? Go ahead. Go find a television station that wants to do that. Like, he could have been yeah. much more intractable, but he's not. Yeah. And, and the right, fact right, right, that he right. allows himself to be emotionally affected and to grow and to change his opinions based on real-time input is just so refreshing um yeah huh. i love that yeah yeah and he shows up i mean he does yeah he invents the mirror not just man. the professionalism yeah exactly not just but but he's going to sort of make the most of the thing even if he goes home and complains and sort of you know kicks his you know can complain to his wife he's he's showing up to work trying to sort of be at his best which is which is a sort of the, the obviously a kind of an admirable nice quality mm-hmm. but in the context of all of his sort of um reasons to be against this idea you know that it's sort of uh it's not it's unexpected i guess mm-hmm. you know and it's it is refreshing i think it's it's great so i'm you know and it's it's also sort of true to the you know the the, the story the history of it like russ i was you know, just gonna ask about that, that yeah yeah that he didn't uh he did not he didn't really see it, but it was, you know, he was, he was like, food is fuel, right? I, I, food is just, you know, if I didn't need food it to art, get through the day, I probably, you yeah, know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So, and they, and the story about the tuna casserole with potato chips, which all, sounds amazing, by the way, but <laughs> <I wouldn't laughs> that right it was now. amazing on set. But <laughs> that, yeah, that's something he, and I forget which book, but he talks about that. He was like, this is what we used to cook. And then, it, you know, he, he and his wife, you know, uh, I think Marion either was a James Beard winner or sort of up for a James Beard award. event. they had a restaurant wow. in Nantucket. I mean, they, oh, they so went he, on to become. Julia inspired yes. them to become like really high level professional foodies. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so cool. and, and then he started Victory Garden and uh, this old house. And so oh, he, wow. he, I think I, I heard some insane number, like he won 17 Emmys, like 17 daytime oh, wow. Emmys. So he, he, he didn't just kind of, you know, open himself up to it for out of professionalism. He sort of became, they talk about him as like a godfather of do it yourself TV. He so invented finding, HGTV for lack of a, you know, easier yeah. Way to put so it. yeah, it's yeah. sort of, you know, watching that journey and not to give things away. I mean, I don't really know where they're going with season two. And I think they made a Bible for three seasons pitching to HBO or studios, you know, so, but, but obviously, you know, he's still, even if he's kind of warming up to her and the process and what he's doing, there's a long way to go to mm-hmm. become that guy. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Who, who, you know, where he's not, has his focus on documentaries or other things that his focus goes straight towards this work that Julia inspired yeah. him. And I love the ongoing trope that Russ is part of where there's all these stick in the mud men who are not in favor of Julia's show until they either taste her cooking 
or one of their yeah. wives makes it at home and they're letting go, yeah. oh my gosh, I went from dinner tasting like crap to dinner being delicious. Yeah. Let's just keep yeah. this sucker. Like the the selfish, the totally selfish evolution of these men on the, <laughs> yeah. the show is hilarious. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, Power of delicious food. Oh, yeah. oh my God. You know? Yeah. So, Fran, you know, we're all focused on this cooking show stuff, which is awesome. And again, everybody watch the show, Julia, on HBO Max. It's amazing. Um, like I said, I was surprised by how riveting I find the show to be. You know, and maybe part of the reason that Julia Child is so frigging compelling, no matter who you are, is uh, she's pretty uh, complex person. Wasn't she? Now, tell me if I'm wrong about this. Was she in the in the CIA during World War II or the, or the pre CIA or something. Did you, did you learn anything yeah, about that? Yeah. I heard OSS and I should know, I should know this, the distinction between CIA and OSS. Office of Strategic Services. It Office, was the yeah, precursor sorry. to the CIA. Yeah. No. Oh, okay. So it wasn't within the CIA or no. a brain. It's literally a precursor. The OSS was the Office of Special Services and it was strategic. strategic. Right? Yeah, strategic you got it. Strategic, yeah. strategic yeah. services run by a guy named Wild Bill Donovan. It was imagined to be yeah. a wartime espionage agency. So the feeling was that there was no place for an organization like this in peacetime. Um, obviously other people had different opinions and the CIA grew out of the OSS, but that's, that's as much as I know about the yeah, OSS. Yeah. This happens, obviously this is before the show takes place. Mm -hmm. Like, so the, the TV show, Julia is sort of the, the beginning of the French chef in 62. And the, if I'm correct, her OSS period was during the war, world war two. And that she literally just felt a sense of duty, you know, and purpose to sort of help, you know, for the cause and the country. And I, I mean, it. she, I'm pretty sure she was actually turned down from the Navy or maybe, you know, Army Navy because of her height. She was that tall. Hey, I the think Marines would have taken her. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, she, uh, so, so yeah, there's this other, this, this, this OSS. Yeah. And, and I got, I think she worked for what a name, Wild Bill Don Donovan. Wow. Um, right. So was she involved in any like, secret missions or projects or like did the oss have like a cue you know that yeah no she had there's some story uh which doesn't it's like hard to believe and so bizarre or sort of silly and maybe not maybe i'm like thinking about it wrong but that she helped develop shark repellent <laughs> wait, wait what for for <laughs> for uh there's some, there's a, uh, yeah, there's a... For what? A like shark, for scuba diving? For people who, yeah, fighter pilots shot down in the ocean, in, in the sea, you know, overseas. Oh my gosh. And to have shark repellent so they're not eaten by sharks. Oh my gosh, jeez. Oh, <laughs> um, 1942, everybody. I mean, look, the world was in a cataclysm. In, in, in many ways, the stakes had never been higher. And yet, it was quite obviously a simpler time. I mean... Can you can you imagine today a government agency having the sort of intellectual bandwidth during <laughs> during like high level espionage to go? You know what we ought to be working on, <laughs> um, right? Right, right. And uh, you know, technically, I'm pretty sure you know Julia's whole cooking career started when she was in France, much later in her life. And so this wasn't like, hey, you know how to cook stuff like maybe we could repellent. like yeah keep her busy <laughs> over here because like we have more important things to do and like let's make let's give her this like weird task you know because she knows how to like make she's good with recipes i don't know so dude what i want to know about this like did it actually work and if so how <laughs> did it taste bad did it smell bad like what was the deal yeah a real thing because i know i've seen this in nature documentaries there's some orcas that killed a uh, great white and no great whites ever came back there because the dead great white released some kind of smell, something in that in dying, some chemical toxin wow. sort of released into the water. Great whites, sharks knew from all over not to go there. Something bad happens there. Because they're such so an there was apex some, predator. Like yeah, so there's something. There's certainly something there. And, uh, it, it, you know, but, but unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, the synthetic version, um, yeah, basically there's memos that came out later, I think in like recently and out of, from the CIA that, uh, yeah, let's the chief of the chief of the Bureau of Aeronautics noted in a memo, slight repellence was shown. 
uh, <laughs> of the sharp repellent cakes, by God. the way. They called them cakes. cakes and like um, urinal cakes, but for repelling sharks. That's what I'm imagining, too. That same size. Yeah, because you're in the water. I was thinking about the poor pilots in the ocean. That sort of whatever slight repellent means. I mean, maybe it lasts. When, when you're dealing with shark attacks, yeah, slight. Yeah. yeah. It's not good enough. Right, yeah, like, it's just not good enough. It bit me one sixteenth of a second later than it would have. <laughs> yeah, I I do. I feel like there's some story of like a like a battleship, you know, something you know getting shot down or sank at sea, and you know sinking in like uh, it, it, people all being eaten by sharks, you know. So maybe there was this was like a legitimate fear, but it seems like not the top of the list of things to worry right. about if for fighter pilots, you know, right. just like maybe just finding them, you know, right. <laughs> or, <laughs> um, you know what I mean? Like, uh, the, like you said, like the bandwidth, but just the resources going right. into this and thinking, wow, is that really like, is that what they're thinking about when a p- fighter pilot's like shot down? Overseas, right. you know? like, like if, I, um, if I'm a fighter pilot, I would be like, look, you can keep the urinal cakes. Um, what I really <laughs> would like is some kind of a lightweight sun shield shield and a waterproof right. flare gun how about how about that right <laughs> right right yeah <laughs> oh man it's really 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 funny hey fran thank you so much for being here with me today it's been an absolute blast everybody get out there and watch julia on hbo max i guarantee you you'll love it whether you think you will or not it's one of the very best shows on tv right now uh i'm completely hooked on it it's been an absolute pleasure to have fran kranz here with me today thanks buddy great thanks to see man you. thank you yeah and i love that what a beautiful support it's true it really is an addictive charming show i mean please check it out yeah yeah absolutely well for fran kranz i'm zevin odelberg and this has been kind of murdery Kinda Murdery, The Emerald Triangle, is created, researched, edited, produced, and hosted by Zevin Odelberg, with opening theme by Niall Madden, and art by The Gin of Lang. Available now on all podcasting platforms. If you like the show, please subscribe, review, and tell your friends. You can find us on social media at Kinda Murdery or email at kindamurdery at gmail.com.